So we'll go ahead and just start kind of talking through some of the stuff, Canvas logistics. Um, of course, my battery's gonna die. Um, so the unit one lecture recording, so those are going up. I'm trying to provide a little bit of topic. Everybody okay with that? Found that if you wanted to use it. Uh, back within our modules, I believe it was that Thursday or last Thursday that I added a, a bunch of stuff. I did open up week three, which should be visible. So our overview, standard, office hour, standard, lecture recordings, I just showed you. Um, supplemental reading resources is what I popped up I think recently as well. I would argue this is this is our first exam up to that fourth chapter. Um, I was talking my, with my wife about it. They go into a lot of detail and then not a lot of detail and so they're kind of all over the place unfortunately. Um, it's just the best resource I've got that's free. Um, so I, I am still going to direct you there. Anytime you see anything that looks like math, avoid it. Because um, we're not going to do math. Um, and if it feels like it's, it's getting too deep for you and you're like, I have no idea what's going on, skip it. Move to the next section. Um, the idea of what I want you to be able to do is scan through that text and use that as a resource to try and add material back from what's going on in the lecture. Does that make sense? So if you're like, I have no idea what Mike just talked about today, hopefully you can pull keyword topics, and I think I'll try and do that too, and focus and say, today is hybridization, which today is. You could then go look up hybridization within the book and read how they're presenting it. I can almost guarantee it, they're gonna present it deeper than we need, um, but that way you've got a secondary resource um, that I sort of vouch for. Uh, you can absolutely use any online content, videos, things like that as well. Okay? That's, this is just a direction that I would kind of send you. Um, I did get active homework two set up, so we can poke at that if people have been working questions on there. Um, I didn't flip any tables building that assignment for once. Um, got close. Uh, but it's at least built, it's got a lot more questions in it than I typically like. But I think we're kind of looking for more questions to give you more practice, so I think that's okay. If you're going through the assignments and you're like, the active is way too long, I need to know so that I can back off some of those. Okay? Active does tell me how much time it's supposed to take. Currently, active thinks active two takes an hour, just so you know. Okay? My brief interaction with online homeworks if they say it takes an hour, you should plan for at least two to three times that, just as an estimate, okay? The questions I selected for that are going backwards and going through this week's content, okay? So it's a mix of both. You should be able to be working on that this week. I tried to do it chronologically based off of what we've seen. I can't guarantee that. Again, that's part of the table flipping. Kind of, sort of? The other resource I want to make sure you're aware of is the suggested questions. So this goes back to that McMurray textbook. I went through and found questions in the additional problem section, so the end of the chapter questions. And I pulled questions out of there or listed them here as what I thought were relevant. Um, some of them I think are very good and some of them I think are just kind of straightforward. I do want to note just so that you're aware of it, I put exclamation points next to ones that I think are particularly challenging. Okay? I do think you have the ability to do them they're just more challenging. Kind of sort of? Yep. So that's my quick review. Do you have questions of what you want me looking at? Or do we just want to go right back into it? Okay. Right back into it it is. <clears throat> So I whipped through this kind of fast, kind of fast, really fast, like a minute, um, last Thursday. So let's slow it down a little bit. 
So when we talk about our electrons and where they exist, we've got energy levels. So I'd argue this section is our energy levels. One, two, three, et cetera. Four, five, six, seven. Of those, we really only care about the first and second energy levels. So most of our work is going to be sitting in those two, arguably three things. Kind of make sense? Every energy level breaks down into orbital types. Okay, that's the simplest way to, to describe it. So if we started here, we have the first energy level, and the first energy level has one orbital type. So that would manifest as a single orbital type. What was that orbital type? One S. S. Okay. One S is a more accurate ref reflection of exactly where that is, but I didn't ask for exactly what that is. I just wanted to know what the orbital type was. The orbital type in this case is S. What is the shape of that S? Okay. Close, not officially a circle. It's a sphere because it's three dimensional. Okay. So, and that becomes important. So when we're talking about our molecules and how we build molecules, what we care about is how these orbitals, these atomic orbitals, interact with other atomic orbitals. That generates bonds. Okay? So we need to know kind of where these things are. Why is a sphere more important? Well, where can I make a bond with a sphere? Anyone? Yeah. All the way around in perfect three-dimensional space. Okay? Whereas if we set a circle, really the only place I could do it would be on the sides, the top, the bottom. I can't make it out in front. Does that make sense? Okay. Every time we go up in energy, we repeat the orbital type. Okay? So if we go up to the second energy, it's going to now split into two orbitals. So every time you go up in energy, you repeat what you had before and you add one more new one. So when we go up, we would also have the S but we also add a new orbital type. That's the P. P. Okay. If I wanted to very specifically refer to this orbital, now I would call it the 2S. The 2S. Okay. Each of those orbitals can hold two electrons. One, two, three, four. Note that we have little arrowheads on it. What are the arrowheads supposed to represent? The line represents electrons. Why do we have an arrowhead on it? It's okay. That's a spin state. How many? It's not even how many. It's representing the spin of the electron. So that when we put electrons together, they have to have opposite spins for them to pair. Okay? Not a big deal. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Okay? Why am I only using a single head on it? I'm only referring to one electron. Okay? Which, if we consider what we did with resonance, we did something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Note that our arrow has two heads on it. Why does our arrow have two heads on it? It's a pair. It's moving two electrons. So the number of heads helps us to represent how many electrons are getting moved in each of those states. Okay. When we jump up to the P, the P gets a little bit more complex, and that has to do with its shape. So when we look at the S, it's still a sphere. What happens to our shape with P? What's that? Peanut. Did you say dumbbell? Peanut works. I've referenced it as a dumbbell. Okay, and we get this kind of odd dumbbell shape. This dumbbell shape adds a couple layers of complexity. Number one, if I'm going to make a bond with that, Right? And a peanut or a dumbbell is better than this shape, because again, three dimensions. Right? Where can I make a bond? Can I make a bond above it? No, because no, there's no orbital overlap. There's no orbital up there to overlap. So when we're talking about making a bond with this orbital, we're really talking about coming in from either side. Okay? The P orbital with that complexity, with that directional kind of aspects to it also means that we increase in complexity and we end up with two more 
I don't know why I like peanut. Peanut's kind of fun, okay? Peanut shapes. So we can take the peanut and run it on this axis. What axis is this? We can call it an ax. X, what axis is this? Y. And this axis? That's an attempt to show the Z. Remember, we're in three dimensions. So we're looking at a peanut if we're my pen here, here, or here. Right? All three of those now manifest for the P. What does that mean for us? Each of those can hold two electrons. Which means when we get to the P, how many electrons can we fit? Six total electrons. All that information is stored on the periodic table, right? Because when we look at our S block, our first two columns, how many columns did I say? Two, because how many electrons can we fit in any of the S orbitals? Two. Our P block has six columns in it because six electrons. Six electrons spread across those three orbitals. Kind of make sense? We could talk about the D and the F, but we never really worry about those, at least for the sake of this class, so we don't have to stress. So this is kind of our fundamental building block. This is where we can place all of our electrons, and it's those electrons that we then want to discuss and try and figure out how they exist and where they can move around. Kind of, sort of? Okay, so there's our S, there's our P, okay? Note that we're trying to show kind of a space-filling model, okay? This isn't that the electron is moving around in a circle. It's that it is contained within the shape of a sphere. That electron is not moving necessarily in straight lines or curved lines or even moving in between space. Okay? Electrons have this weird habit that they can pretty much jump, teleport wherever they want within that space. Okay? Technically, they can even teleport without it or outside it, except the probability decreases. So what we're looking at here is 95% of the time, if I reference the electron at the 1s energy level, I would find it within that sphere, 95% of the time. For the 2p on the, what they're now labeling as the z-axis, okay, 95% of the time we'd find it in those two locations. No, we don't find it at all right in the middle, or very, very low probabilities. That's the point of that shape is we're saying low probabilities here because it's a smaller shape. Okay? They called this the z-axis. What did we call this axis? Because it was the y. The y. Who's correct? Both. Unfortunately, both of us are correct and neither of us. Okay? X, Y, Zs are human inventions to try and put a location on things. We have to realize that our organic molecules are always spinning, flipping, and rotating. We pick an X, Y, Z axis to answer the question that we are being asked or the question that we are asking to learn about what's going on. Okay? So you will see me kind of oscillate back and forth between any labeling of the X, Y, and Z axes. Okay? And that's because it's a, entirely a human figment. Kind of make sense? Okay. So, hybridization theory. So this is the, the kind of extra layer that makes this kind of more complicated. The taskbar is bugging me. Of course, that didn't do what I wanted it to do. Um, that makes things a little bit more complicated when we get to our molecules. So if I had asked you to draw methane... CH4, right? we would draw our carbon in the middle. We could draw on our four bonds to our hydrogens. Okay? That would be a Lewis representation. That would be a horrible three-dimensional representation because what shape does methane take on? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. How do we get to it being a tetrahedral shape? Yeah, why do I know that's a tetrahedral shape? As a cheat that works well for OCHEM, we're digging a little bit deeper, though. There's that table that we should be going through, and we would look and we'd say around our center atom of carbon, there's four groups of electrons, which puts us in the tetrahedral shape. Okay. Our drawing does not accurately show a tetrahedral shape. So what can we do to change? The wedges and 
we can introduce the use of wedges in dashes, and now we have an appropriate shape. Okay? Just because you could encounter something like this, maybe. Does this shape work? That's a hard question. Is either one of those more correct than the other? Technically, no. Technically, yes. Turns out the shape of the first, with the wedge and the dash there, and the solids over there. That is a valid drum. This one is invalid. Okay? How do we know it's invalid? Well, we know it's invalid if I have a model built. If we look at a model and try and orient this, I want this hydrogen, there we go, coming out at you. I want this hydrogen going away. Well, we'll say it's that one. We'll say it's going away. Kind of see that? So that hydrogen is going away, that one's coming at you. We should already have problems with this. This one is going away from us on what side of the carbon atom? Left or right? Left. Where is that one? Right. It's drawn on the opposite side of where it's actually located. The solid lines are right here. Where are those solid lines? Straight up and down. What you will find is there is no physical way you can change the orientation, your viewpoint, on a methane three-dimensional molecule to make this drawing true. What does that mean? This drawing should never be drawn. Right? So how do we know how to draw it appropriately? The way that I describe it is look at your solid lines. There's a V. Right? Everybody see the V? There's a V. Look at your wedge and your dash. There's a V. When we appropriately draw a tetrahedral structure, the V points at each other. Do you have a V? No. And for those people being like, no, and just kind of accept it, what if I did something just slightly tweaked? Right? Do I have V's now? Kind of. Yeah, that's still a V. That's a V. Still not appropriate. Because what did I say? The points of the V's have to be aimed kind of at each other. The points of the V's aren't aimed at each other, they're overlapping each other. Does that make sense? Okay. It is challenging to wrap your head around. If you can get that patterning, that will set you up for later in the semester. Because later in the semester, I think this particular unit, it is going to manifest as a problem. And you will try to answer questions based off of a drawing like this. This drawing doesn't exist in the real world. So answering a question based off of a bad drawing results in the wrong answer. So you have to be kind of careful with how you draw things out. I had a pen, didn't I? Oh, there it is. Okay. When we go through and now look at our appropriately drawn methane, the bond angles that we have in here are 109.5. Ultimately, I just want you to remember that they're not 90, that they are larger than 90 for that shape. This specific number isn't a big deal. Right? Why is this going to become important for us? Well, all four of those bonds are identical. They're all bonded to a hydrogen. Since all the hydrogens are the same, we would expect each of those bonds to be identical. Right? Those bonds hold electrons. What holds electrons? Don't tell me bonds. What holds electrons? Orbitals. Okay? Which means we should be able to go back to our atomic structure that has all this fun stuff about orbitals and say what orbitals made those bonds. The hydrogen should be relatively straightforward because what's our electron configuration for the hydrogen? It's not quite right. It's close. Hydrogen has one electron. Where is hydrogen's one electron? It's in the first energy level, so it's one. 
S. Cool, that's a sphere, which means it can make that bond on any given direction and they're all equivalent. So that's perfectly logical and fine. Okay, so that sphere works. But what happens when we look at the carbon? It has stuff in the 2p, 1p? We've got two p's. The bond angle between our p orbitals is one's on the x-axis, one's on the y-axis. What's the bond angle between an x and a y? 90 degrees. What does it need to be? 109.5. So our atomic understanding of orbitals doesn't translate to our molecular understanding. What we see and know to be true within our geometries of where those atoms are in space doesn't reflect accurately with what happens with our atomic level. Right? So what we have to go through and do is come up with a theory to explain how we can make that shift. There are varying theories that come out. Okay? The easiest one to manipulate and understand, and easy is still a stretch, is hybridization theory. So what we go through and we do is we say, okay, what do I need? Okay? For this structure to exist, that carbon needs to have four equivalent orbitals. They all have to be identical to each other for it to work. I have four orbitals. They aren't all identical. Well, what were orbitals? Energy orbitals? They are energy. They're a probability. They're just a shape. Think of them like Plato. Right? So what I can do is take those four orbitals and I say, well, I don't like the shape that any of those are in. So I'm going to take all four of those, I'm going to mash them all together, and I'm going to create four new orbitals. Why do I have to create four new ones? Sort of. That might be a more correct answer. I want an easier answer. Orbitals are not technically matter, but if they are an energy, can you create or destroy energy? No. no. So if I take four energies and I put them together, what do I need out? Four energies. Four energies. I can't get rid of them. I can't delete them, which will become relevant here in a second. They have to still be present. So if I'm going to take four of those together, I'm going to make four new orbitals. Those four new orbitals will orient themselves in a tetrahedral space around the carbon. Why are they occupying that tetrahedral space? Because that's where I know the electrons need to be to make those bonds. So effectively, I just say, I want it to happen, so it happens. Okay? So I create four new things. Great. What do I want to call those four new things? becomes the next complexity. We created something new, right? If I invent a, a phenomenal surface that sticks, but the, it's slightly removable, like I can take it off and put it somewhere else, I can write stuff on one side, and I get to name it, right? I could theoretically name it after myself, and I call it the McFavlinit. Or we might call it the Post-it. We're naming things potentially after however we want to describe them. Science tends to be very egomaniacal, so almost always we'll get things kind of named after the person that discovered it. Right? This isn't a discovery. This is just magic. We're just saying it has to happen. I hope it works this way. Right? So we don't get a name after it, but we get to name it. Well, how do you want to name it? Should it just be a random thing? Just open up the dictionary, boom, I'm gonna name it serendipitous. Would that be an easy thing for you to process and memorize? No. No. Right? So what we try to do is come up with a name that allows us to understand how those orbitals were made. Okay? That introduces a layer of complexity, I would argue somewhat unintentionally, that confuses people, but we'll try and address it. Okay? The name I'm going to create for when I take all four of my atomic orbitals and mash them together is going to be the combination of all of the orbitals that made them up. Okay? Kind of like my name. My name is a mashup of my wife's and mine. We mashed them together and created a new name. That's exactly what we're going to do here. 
So in that mashup, I took an S orbital and I took three P orbitals. So I will call it SP3. Okay. Each of these new orbitals is called SP3. So I get four of them. So when we say, oh, that's an SP3, really what we're saying is that's an SP3 and there's three others just like it, also called SP3s. Kind of, sort of? We don't care necessarily about the XYZ axes, largely because they're falling in a three-dimensional space and they're twi twisted off of it on that tetrahedral space. So we could really only get away with saying, this one's on the x-axis and all the others are not on that axis. Okay, so that's not easy to label those. So we just call them sp3. So we get four sp3s. What if I go through and say, instead of needing something with four equivalent groups, I needed something with three. So if I looked at the structure of borane, BH3, Boron comes in with three valence electrons. Hydrogen each comes in with one. I need six total electrons in my drawing. Boron's the least electron I get that can bridge, but boron's my center. Two, four, six electrons. I've got all my valence electrons in there. There's my Lewis structure for boron. How many groups of electrons, or how many bonds, orbitals, do I need to explain that shape? Three. I need three. Okay. The bond angle between those misleadingly drawn would theoretically need to be what bond angle? Is it trigonal the shape is trigonal planar which leads us to 120 degrees. Okay. If we're really good with geometry that 120 helps us out with trigonal planar because 120 plus 120 plus 120 is 360. We've done a full loop all the way around the circle of that plane. Okay? So we need 120 degrees away from each other. So should I use the sp3s? No. The sp3s were 109. I need 120. Can I just use the p orbitals? No, no because we need the I'm going to come back to your s statement. It's a really important statement. Why can't I use just the p orbitals? What bond angle is in our p orbitals? 90, and I need 120. The p orbitals are our x, y, and z. Only our sp3 are the 109. Okay? So those p orbitals are all 90 degrees, and I need 120. So I can't use just the p orbitals either. I have to, again, hybridize. You made an awesome statement. You have to use the s. Absolutely phenomenally true. Why do we always have to use the s in our hybrid orbital? This isn't our first energy level. If we're looking at it for boron, we're looking at the second energy level. Perhaps right idea and wrong words. Why do I always have to use the S? The S is the lowest energy. When I put hydrogen's one electron into its electron configuration, where do I put that one electron for hydrogen? S1. And in particular, did you say it? No. What did you say? S. S. S is just a type. Do I put it in the 7S? 1S. I put it in the 1S. Could I put it in the 7S? No. Yes. Yes, I can. But to do that, what do I have to do? Put in a ton of energy to keep the electron at that 7s. What is that electron naturally going to do? Fall back down to the 1s. It goes to the lowest energy state. When we're looking at hybridizing, we want to hybridize with our lowest energy orbitals. S orbitals are lower than p orbitals as far as energy. It's not a lot, but it's enough. It's enough that when we go through to hybridize, we always start with the s, and we'll start adding in p to get us those extra orbitals. So when I now look at boron with those three groups of electrons, I say I need an S and two P's. Two P's. What name will I call that? 
sp2. How many sp2s did I create? Three. How many atomic orbitals did I start with? Four. But you're telling me I only have three. I have three sp2 and a p orbital that's left over that did not hybridize. It's not mixed in. It just chilled out on the end. So instead of taking all four making my Play-Doh bonds, I only took three of them to make my Play-Doh bonds. One of them was left untouched. Kind of, sort of? You're giving me a face that's making me a little nervous. I'm just focused. Trying to process it. It's, I'm, it's challenging. All right. So the intent here is that all we're trying to do is to explain how those bonds could possibly come into existence. Okay. Which one looks like a drumstick? The ones that are in the SP. Which one looks like an hourglass? Well, it's not. Why do some look like drumsticks and one, some look like hourglasses? Because they look like problems. I, I would add to your question, there's another one. Some look like spheres. Yeah. Why do some look like spheres, some look like drumsticks, and some look like hourglasses? It's what orbital they are. The S looks like a sphere. The P looks like an hourglass. Okay? The SP hybrid, or SP2, SP3, look like drumsticks. Why do they look like drumsticks? Can you mash them together? Uh, yes. Oh, this may be a bad idea. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to try. Here's an S orbital. Okay? What we're talking about with our orbitals is energy. Right? Energy, electromagnetic spectrum, energy. How does energy move? In concentration gradients. As a wave. <laughs> energy always moves as a wave. Okay? So if I look at the S orbital, okay, it's always the same phase when we describe it. Okay? That phase, if we're looking at that wave, it could always be positive or it will always be negative. Those are kind of your two options that come out of it. Those are your two probability states. Bring in probability into it. What happens when we bring in a p orbital? That center part right there in the p orbital, that's what's known as a node. Right? The s orbital doesn't have one. What happens at that node? Positive, positive, boop, negative, 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 whoop, positive, positive, positive. A node is where we transition from positive to negative. That's a node. The S orbital could either be positive or negative, but there's no internal node, which means it stays constant once it's been defined. The P orbital, on the other hand, will always have two states. One node will be positive, one node will be negative. Typically, when we go through and look at a p orbital, whoops, as I use an eraser to draw, you will see it shaded on one side and the other side not shaded. Why? Because the electrons are on that side. No. The phase is either positive or negative. It's not electron presence, because remember, the electrons can exist at either side. It's the phase of the energy at that point That's or at that right. side. So we're either saying it's positive or negative. We don't care necessarily which one it is until we start to actually try and combine things. Okay? So you will see the shading difference here. That shading difference is just trying to show that there are nodes. There's a node where we have changes in phase. Why is that important? Right? Well, it moves as a wave, right? What if two waves hit each other? What happens? I don't think I can do this, right? What happens when two waves hit each other? They converge. They converge, yeah. I can draw a little bit better. 
Here's this wave, and here's another wave. What would happen in that scenario? They do overlap. Why does that matter? There's another way they could have hit each other, right? Couldn't they have hit each other like this? What would have happened then? I'll take that as a subtle hint that I should speed up this. Oh, no. Blue versus black, they run destructive interference. This one's positive, this one's negative. What happens when I add those waves? It flatlines. I get nothing. What happens if they're constructive? Positive and positive, it doubles in intensity. Kind of, sort of? Same thing happens here, but here we're doing it with a drawing that makes it a little bit strange. So how does that work? Well, this space is all positive overlap, right? Okay, which means there's an increased likelihood of finding the electrons there. So instead of showing this as two separate independent orbitals, what I might want to do is say, let's hybridize those and mix them together. Increased likelihood. I show the increased likelihood by doing what with my shape? Close. We could probably get away with that. Making it a little bit bigger. Right? So we could say there's an increased likelihood of finding the electrons on that side because there's constructive overlap. What happened on the other side? That's negative and positive. If it's positive and negative, it's not constructive. It's deconstructive. It effectively flatlines. There's still a little bit of space out there where we can get electrons. But to show that deconstructive interference, I would show a smaller shape. What shapes are we showing? Drumsticks. Drumsticks to represent that constructive interference of the S with the P and the destructive interference with the S and the P. That's what's generating those new shapes. That's why they look a little bit goofy. Kind of, sort of? I don't know who asked that. It's a good question. It was probably just more than we wanted. Okay. What happens as we continue? Well, we could continue to the system where we just have two groups of electrons. And we end up with two hybrid orbitals, each of them called sp, and we'd have two leftover p orbitals that didn't get hybridized. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Okay. So what we're trying to do is to use this to try and come up with an understanding of what's going on with those individual shapes and how that would manifest with the orbitals. We know our atomic understanding doesn't work, so we invent a new system that we call hybridization theory to help explain that away. Okay? There are some cheats we can do within this. Look at the number of electron groups. So theoretically, you're not great at drawing Lewis structures, so you've got a Lewis structure. Ta-da! How many electron groups are there? Okay? So if we drew out, uh, let's do something like this. I want to know the hybridization of that green atom. Okay, so I said the cheat, number of electron groups. How many groups of electrons around that green atom? Two. Two. Rewind back to the beginning of last week, maybe even the week before that. Probably week three, probably the beginning of last week. When we talked about Lewis structure, maybe even actually the end of last week, okay? We made some simplifications within Lewis structure. What were those simplifications? Every point is a carbon. Every point is a carbon. Does that change your answer? Too long. No, it doesn't. What else do you assume? Each carbon has um, its octet. Octet. How many electrons are on that carbon? That are shown. Two. Sorry. There's only four. Four, because there's two bonds, so two groups of electrons, that's four electrons. It has an octet. Is four eight? No. no. It needs two more groups of electrons, which are implied hydrogens. What does that mean? How many groups of electrons around that carbon? Four. Damn. This is where that Lewis simplification can bite us, because we won't see those hydrogens 
and we'll start saying it has two groups of electrons. Nope, it's got four because of the implied hydrogens. This is why it's really important to know those simplifications. Make sense? So, four groups of electrons. Numbers of electron groups, we've got four. Is the number of orbitals in my hybrid, which means how many orbitals do I need in my hybrid? Four. So, S, P, P, S, P, three. Okay, if we look at the hybridization, this is a rel relatively simple trick that a student showed me that at first I was like, eh, that's not a big deal, but I don't know, kind of works. Look at the exponents. There's an implied one next to the S, right? Mm -hmm. What's one plus three? Four. Four. For how many groups of electrons? Four. Four. Three. Three groups of electrons. So the hybridization can help kind of imply that information. Kind of sort of? So not only now do you have to look at a Lewis structure and interpret our missing hydrogens, but now you have to be able to look at that Lewis structure. Uh, da, da, da. And you need to be able to tell me the hybridization. Well, the hybridization of what? Let's pick that carbon. Green carbon. What's its hybridization? We'd look at that green atom, we'd see that there's three pairs of electrons around it. To see, reach its octet, there's an implied hydrogen, which means how many groups of electrons around that? How many groups? Some people started to balk. Why do you say three? Uh, the double bond is a group of this. Uh, the double bond is a group of electrons. They're in the same space. Right? So that has three groups of electrons, which means the hybridization of that carbon is? SP2, sorry. <laughs> okay, SP2. Blue carbon. Hybridization, that was asked the question. SP3? No, SP2. It is still SP2. That double bond. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why we try to really understand what our drawings mean. You'll note that when you get people that have been drawing for a while, they get sloppy. The interpretation still holds. It becomes more challenging, potentially, for you. That's why the exams are typed, not hand-drawn, to kind of minimize some of that. So this is where looking at practice problems can help out, because you'll see nicer drawings than what I've got. Okay. Purple carbon. That one's now just SP. Smiling, do you think you're getting it? Yeah. Okay. Of course, it's a different color. Gotta ask. Hybridization on the nitrogen. Just S. Why are you laughing at me? Confused. Which part? The nitrogen. Okay, so let's double back out of the nitrogen. Are you okay with purple, blue, and green? Uh, who said SP? Was it just you? Okay. Why did you say SP? Because there's only two electron groups. The triple bond is going to only act as one electron. Those electrons are all in the same space. Right? So if we scaled this up so that we could actually look at the full-on Lewis structure, okay, number one, it takes a lot of time, so we tend to not do it. But if we looked at our full Lewis structure, there's our square, there's that bond, one, two, three, there's that bond. Right? So that's showing as two groups of electrons. There's nothing on those sides of the face. Right? Does that make sense? You feel better about purple? Yeah, I'm still confused on nitrogen. Okay, we can be confused on nitrogen. That's okay. Okay, I heard just S. I'm seeing a just, or I'm also seeing an SP. Any other guesses? So 
going back to those simplifications that we talked about. Okay? And with hydrogens, we do not imply hydrogens on heteroatoms. We only imply them on carbons. So you're right, we're missing the octet on the nitrogen, and I cannot add a hydrogen. Absolutely phenomenal. And then I'll leave awkward silence. Was there another simplification? This one was a watch out and be careful. It was the very last one in the list. Is something with the non-bonding pairs? Yep. The nictogens and the chalcogens, which ultimately means oxygen, or sorry, if we do it appropriately, the nictogens, nitrogen, and our chalcogens, oxygen, very commonly, and even our halogens, we will imply lone pairs. Okay? Why are we implying them? To get to the octet. Why am I implying them anyway? Because I'm too lazy to draw those extra two dots. Okay? And at this stage, you might be like, that's painfully lazy. You should draw them in. Okay? I will try my best to do that. Okay? but I can't guarantee it. And I would almost guarantee by the end of the semester, you won't draw them in either, okay? Because that's how painful it can be to draw those. As soon as we add those two electrons to it, do you want to hold your S configuration? No. Now, how many groups of electrons are around the nitrogen? Two, two. two which means our hybridization is SP. SP. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have to be very comfortable with those organic simplifications because everything we do asks questions about them. Okay, and even still, I may be half decent on including all those lone pairs. I cannot guarantee the same for anybody else out there in the world. Okay, even the textbook we're using, they will very often drop them as well. Okay? So, what does this mean for us? Well, we need this framework to address what we talked about all the way back at the very beginning when we referenced multiple bonds. I said they aren't single, double, and triple. What I said was there's sigma and pi. A single is a sigma, and a double is a sigma and a pi. Right? That's what I said. And then a triple is a sigma and two pi. Okay? How does this manifest? Okay, so what we could go through and do is look at what happens when we try to make these bonds. We looked at BH3 relatively quickly. Okay? If we drew out our Lewis structure, we'd go through and say its hybridization was what? SP2. This one ends up being SP2. For those of you being like, but it's missing its octet, this is one of the nasty things with boron is it floats in this weird gray area. It only has three valence electrons. We don't imply a lone pair there. That would actually have to be explicitly stated. And even then, it's not stated because that's unstable. Okay? So this is why we shouldn't imply lone pairs. We should actually aggressively show them. So what does that mean for our drawing? Well, if we go through and look at our boron, that means we're going to end up with some hybrids. Okay, I'm attempting to show those as drumsticks, and I'm not good enough to hand draw them being off different axes. So we're just saying there's three drumsticks. And I would have one P orbital. Is that kind of clear? Do we see those as drumsticks and P orbitals? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is this important for us? Well, in each of those bonds, that boron is... Con whoops, that's an eraser. That boron is contributing an sp2 hybrid what is the s what is the sorry I may have given it away what is the hydrogen contributing an s so to make that bond i have an s orbital and i have an sp2 orbital those things are overlapping to make that bond okay what's happening out here another sp2 and another s what's happening here another sp2 and another s okay when we drew that out, we talked about that lone pair being weird, and there isn't a lone pair there. What is there? Nothing is there. There's empty space, but there is an orbital. 
And that orbital has exactly how many electrons in it? Zero. Because boron brought in three electrons. One, two, three. The hydrogens each brought in one electron. One, two, three. Those are now paired. We've got all of our valence electrons satisfied, which means that P orbital is now empty. It's an orbital. And what could I potentially put into an orbital? Electrons. What we now just addressed is how BH3 can react with something else. BH3 can float around in solution and something else can come along and share electrons with it to make a bond because there's an empty orbital to place those electrons. That's pretty neat. At least I think it's neat. Okay? It's one of the things that makes BH3 a pain in the butt to work with and we'll probably deal with it a little bit later in the semester. What's happening with CO2? Well, if we drew out our structure for CO2, Right? We've got our Lewis structure for CO2. I now want to explain its bonding. How many electron groups are around the carbon? Two. two. Remember, the double bonds are still a same space. So I get two electron groups, which means SP. So we get chicken wing. Anybody hear that? Chicken wing. Kid sings that song all the time. Okay, so we only needed two electron groups, right? So we had S and a P, which means what's left over? Two more S. The S went into the hybrid. How many S's do I start with? One. One, which means do I have any S left over? No, you said nope. I have two P orbitals left over. Okay, and this is where I have to get a little bit fancy with it. We'll call that the Y axis. And we'll call this one the z-axis. So now when I go through and make the bond with oxygen, oxygen is similarly sp2 hybridized. One of those oxygens comes in and makes an overlap with one of those sp's, right? So we got the carbon sp over here, and we'll have the oxygen, whoops, sp, did we say sp? Oh, yeah, yeah. The other one was sp2. And we'll take the oxygens, sp2, and that makes that bond. What happens on the other side? The exact same thing. There's the sp. We'll call it the purple oxygen. And we'll have the sp2. Everybody see how those bonds are now being made? Questions? You got a question here you got to ask. So yeah, at this point, the biggest thing we're just trying to do is to identify those hybridizations. We don't necessarily need, even need to know where they're coming from. Carbon has two groups of electrons. It has to hybridize an S and a P. That's going to make my two SPs. And then I have two P orbitals left over that didn't get touched. Okay, and this, we have two SPs here, which means how many P orbitals do I need? One, but I wrote two P's. Why can't I write two P's? Half of a P orbital goes into this one. The other half of the P orbital goes into that one. Okay? It's a hybrid. We're splitting it. Each of them are called an SP. What did we just describe, though? We described the bond right here, red and blue, and we described the bond here, red and purple. What have we not described? What's making the green bonds? The same thing. It can't be the same thing, because as soon as I overlap those orbitals with each other, they become a molecular orbital. And how many electrons can I fit in that orbital? Two. Two. I need four electrons there. SP3 says we're adding another hybridization to it. We'd be changing the bond angle. The bond angle here is 180. What is making those green bonds? You're making an assumption that the bonds can only be made 
with hybrid orbitals. Guess what can also make bonds? The, the unhybridized p orbitals can make a bond. So when I look at the double bond here, first I get an sp sp2 sigma bond to both those oxygens. What's happening to make that green bond? Well, I'm going to take a p orbital from the carbon and a p orbital from the oxygen to make a new bond. That p orbital is because the orbitals overlap. When we look at the formation of the carbon oxygen sigma bond, chicken wing, chicken wing. This was my carbon sp. This is my oxygen sp2 because it had three groups of electrons. That overlap right there is now making the bond. That's giving me a connection. That's now saying the electrons on the carbon can be shared with the oxygen. I can only fit two electrons in that space. That becomes very problematic considering I know I need four. But I can't put another orbital in that same space because that's now putting too many electrons into the exact same space. I can't do that. Electrons repel away. So what happens? This is where we look at the unhybridized p orbital on the carbon that wasn't touched. Guess what also sits on the oxygen? Because it was sp2, there's an empty p orbital. There's another p orbital on the oxygen. Now what happens? Be like, well, are those overlapping? Okay, so for the, gr for the black ones, can you see that they overlap? How do you see that they overlap? The shading. The shading. So if I get rid of the shading, now they aren't overlapping? Or are those overlapping? They're overlapping. Okay, so it's not just the shading. What about the one in black allows you to say they're overlapping? Okay, they're connected. Fully accept. They're overlapping. They're connected. Are the green ones overlapping? No. No. And if they don't overlap, what does that mean about the ability for the electron to be shared? It can't be, which means no bond. But I know there is a bond. So this is where things get funny with our electrons. Remember when we talked about the electron, right? That orbital? What was that percentage? What did that space mean? 95% of the time it can exist within that space. What could it do the other 5% of the time? It, that space. it could exist outside of that space. Guess what's happening over here? That's that 5%. It's a little bit more complex than that. But that's roughly the 5%. Okay? But that p orbital has to be in alignment there. With our black one, this is direct orbitals overlapping. Okay, so the black one directly overlap. The green ones are not directly overlapping. What you're seeing is something like this, with my hands upright. Okay? And as long as we get close enough without actually touching, the electrons can do that 5%. Whoop, I'm going to jump. I don't actually pass through that space. I got that teleport ability. If you're ever wondering, like, what the heck's going on with, like, the Marvel movies, that's exactly what they're doing. Quantum, done. It happens. Okay? It's known as quantum tunneling. You can actually do mathematics to prove it all and all that. It's exciting. Okay? But our electron can jump. Well, if an electron from here makes it over to here, what am I saying happened? They bonded. They, bonded. they shared electrons. Ta-da, there's a bond. But this bond has an interesting artifact associated with it. The electrons can only tunnel if there's something to tunnel into. What do I mean? Whoop. Can the electrons tunnel anymore? No. Those of you being like, well, what about the center of your hand? Well, do you tell me the center of my hand? What was the probability of finding electrons in the center of my hand? Zero. They can't exist there. What does that mean happens? When our orbitals are perpendicular to each other, the electron can't jump. Only when they come into parallel can they jump. 
What does that mean for us? When you see a double bond, what happens? Can the bond rotate? If it rotates, what did you do to the bond? You broke it. Can a sigma bond or a single bond rotate? What happens when I rotate? It's still connected. It's still connected, which means our single bonds or our sigma bonds are freely allowed to rotate. Whereas our double bonds, and I would argue not double bonds, our pi bonds, cannot rotate. What we just presented through a BS, let's just make this stuff happen, explained a phenomenon that we see with the actual molecules. These things can't rotate. That's pretty cool. We also explained the existence of the double bond. It wasn't just because I need to satisfy octets. It's because the orbitals overlapped to allow that to happen. That's pretty cool. So this BS, just magic, let's just see what happens, work to explain some pretty fundamental observations. That's pretty cool. So the big things you need to get out of this, okay? There are two bond types. There's the direct overlap. The direct overlap is what we're showing here in black. That involved what kind of an orbital? SP. SP. That's not SP. But it's still involved in that bond, right? So what I would call this is SP type. That black bond, or even just S type, because a hydrogen can do this with an S orbital. If I have any S hybridization at all, I'm going to have a direct overlap. Right? And because I know I'm using S orbitals, I'll reference that type of direct overlap as a particular type of bond which we've already established before. What kind of bond did we want to call it? Sigma, bond. Sigma bonds. The green bonds, or the green overlap here, is an indirect overlap. Since it's an indirect overlap of orbitals, we have to call that a new name. It can't be a sigma bond because it's not connecting the exact same way. It's doing weird quantum BS. So I need to come up with a name for it. Well, we call this one a sigma bond because it involved S-type orbitals. This indirect, indirect overlap involves what kind of orbitals? P-type. P-type. Therefore, we will call it pi bonds. And what we have now established is the formation of sigma and pi and where they're coming from. They're coming out of hybridization theory. The big conclusions, again... Um, can I delete all this? I want to fish for the next slide. Was it yes? We're good with that? Okay. Let's see if I actually have the conclusion thing on it. Mm. Man, it would be really nice if I had the conclusion thing on it. I didn't. Okay. Big conclusion, so we'll just talk through it. Sigma bonds freely rotate. Pi bonds do not rotate. And we'll see a manifestation of that here in a second. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, if we were to look at a molecule, C2H4, because you all are great with Lewis structure, right? You would be able to go through and say C, C, H. I'm going to do H, 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 and I'm going to put the other H's over here, and then that means I need a double bond in between. Yeah? Woohoo! Fantastic, lovely. Lewis structure is that a good a good Lewis structure? Yes, perfectly fine Lewis structure. Is that a good actual representation of the molecule? Why not? Yes. Still two-dimensional, but a better representation of the molecule. Why? Because it shows the bond in relation to each other. I don't like your words. Okay. You're not wrong. <laughs> I just don't, uh, it's not good enough for me. The hydrogens are all the same spot away from each other. Better? What's that? 
The bond angles are now more appropriately shown to be 120. How do we know they're supposed to be 120 degrees? There's three groups of electrons around the carbon, which means it has the trigonal planar geometry, okay? which means they should be drawn as this 120 degrees to better represent the three-dimensional molecule. What hybridization would each of, the, each of those carbons be? Don't say it out loud. Nate, think through it. You don't have to shout, shout it out. It's okay. Think through the hybridization. What hybridization should the, either one of those carbons be? Okay, you can say it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, sp2. You got three groups of electrons. That's going to be the sp2 hybrid. I was trying to not put you on the spot. I just wanted to make sure you had time to think through it. So we've got a Lewis structure, electron groups, three, hybridization, sp2. What are the overlaps? What are we talking about for the overlaps? What orbitals are overlapping in that green space, that green arrow? What was that? We have carbon, sp2, bonded to the hydrogen. Uh, and I started to drop in the number, and I didn't want it. S. That explains that bond. Make sense? What orbital overlap do we have in blue? What the blue arrow is pointing to? Oh, the blue arrow? Yeah, blue arrow. Okay, those are the orbitals that are contributing to make that bond. Red arrow. So when you say S type, it makes sense to say S type because what are the S types? S is an S type. SP3 is an S type. SP2 is an S type. SP is an S type. So there's a bunch of S types. What are the P types? There's a reason we don't say type. It's because it's just a P, right? It is only that P. I don't want you saying the, the type because then is SP2 a P type? No, it's an S type, okay? So red, we said, was uh, the P type. Where did all those dots come from? That was weird. Um, and the blue one, we said, was SP2, SP2. Could the blue one be on top and the red one be on the bottom? Yeah. Yes. The order between those doesn't matter. It's just the electrons occupying that space. Okay? Here's the next. Um, I actually know. Okay? What does this mean? So when we're talking about all those orbitals, what I want you to kind of think about is what does this mean for the overall molecule? Okay. If we change our viewpoint on this molecule, we take this compound like this that is planar, trigonal planar, trigonal planar, right? It's a planar molecule, and I take this and I pull it out and name it like this. Where are all the atoms? Well, I'd have, if I pulled it based off of how I just gestured my hands, we have that red carbon in front. We would then have these hydrogens coming at you. We'd have the black carbon in back. Like, that's going to be fun to draw, right? Because it's behind the red carbon. Okay, And then we have its hydrogens dashed going away, right? And all of those atoms would be in the exact same space. That makes it very hard to see, right? So if you're looking at that being like, I don't understand what that shows, that's because what we've done is I said, here's an iPad. Everybody can draw it. Yeah, 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 there's a box. Draw it like this now. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, there's nothing to draw anymore. Like, it just disappeared, okay? That's what happened. Why do I want to do that, though? Those P orbitals, there's a P orbital here and a P orbital here. Where are they? Not touching each other. They're not touching each other. Awesome. Didn't expect that answer. Absolutely right. Keep going. I want to draw a P orbital on this carbon. Where do I draw it? What was that? Mm -hmm. 
Like that? Up and down? No. Yeah? Okay. The problem with drawing it that way is what is that p orbital overlapping? These bonds and these bonds. That unhybridized p orbital is perpendicular to the sigma bonds. That's not perpendicular. That's overlapping. What would perpendicular be? So like this, but then it's overlapping that. Being a bit of a twit, try again. You mean like that? No. That's what you, yes, that's what you want to say. The P orbital is coming in and out of the plane at you. That's where the P orbital is located. If it is anywhere in the plane of this paper, it's going to overlap one of those orbital systems. It has to be perpendicular to the bond. Since all of those bonds are in the plane of the paper, the only place that's perpendicular to it is coming straight out of the board at you. Is that something that's lovely to draw on this nice two-dimensional drawing? No. But what happens if we take that nice two-dimensional drawing and we take it and rip it out of the board and aim it at you so that it looks ugly as all hell? Now what can we do? Now where are the p orbitals? Now they're straight up and down, and now we can see those orbitals are coming into alignment. They are overlapping. Which brings up kind of the next question. If I rotated this, what happens to these red hydrogens? If I took that carbon and I just spun it, rotated that, but left the back one in play, what would happen to these red atoms? Yeah, those red atoms would turn here. But what happens to the p orbital? It turns on to the axis. It turns on to the axis, which then means, do we have any orbital overlap? No, nope, which means we broke the bond. What does that mean? You can't rotate. That means these atoms are locked into that configuration, and there's nothing that we can, nothing that we can do to permutate out of that. Is that a question? The black C is this guy. It's behind. Because this is a plane. Are you looking at it from this way? There's my elbow ish. Why is my arm not working? Okay, there's my red atom, there's my black atom, there's my elbow. So you're looking at the this one. You're looking at it right there. Where's the black atom? What happened to my elbow? It's still there. It's behind my hands. So what we're trying to show is that that's gone behind. So of course not the right hybridization, but it'll kind of work. Mm, we got red atoms. Let's do the red atoms. Right there. What is this? saying, yeah, 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 okay. I, I, you're not talking about seeing this one from the side. You're talking about seeing this one from that side. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, exactly right. This becomes one of the challenging things is we got to make sure we get the viewpoint on what we're referencing as we view things. So what you're saying is eyeball, little eyelashes. We're looking at it from that way. Okay. That's how we're getting down to there. Which I need to remember to draw eyeballs. Is there a left? No. Is there a right? And yeah, a lot of it's going to come down to what viewpoint. For this particular one, what I was envisioning is how I get my hand down. And oh. I couldn't envision doing that easily. Yeah. So that's why I drew it there. Kind of sorta? Okay. We're down at 115, are we? Yeah. Okay. I just want to see what was there. There's a prettier picture of it all. And what it brings in is this concept of cis and trans, which is a nomenclature thing, which I really don't care about, to be honest. But it is nomenclature. You guys theoretically watched the video on nomenclature. 
Were you all good with that? No one asked any questions about nomenclature? I mean, I didn't really understand any of them, but uh -huh. I was waiting for you to lecture on it. <laughs> so, lecture on it. Let's go through and take a look. We look at functional groups, which is really just talking about functional groups. Nomenclature says play posit sign. Play posit. 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 Not play posit, not nomenclature. There's nothing for me to lecture on. There isn't. So when we talk about nomenclature, that is your nomenclature. So now it's just a question of practice, looking at those drawings and following the rule sets kind of identified within here. So it's find the longest carbon chain and just kind of work through it and come up with names. I think the hard thing was that uh, you were naming things without describing that slide at all. Oh, describing this slide? Yeah. Oh. It like, I don't even think it showed that slide, really. What? Went to the next one. It does, like, these guys were like three seconds. Yeah, yeah. Oh. the introduction was very hard to understand. Yeah, I, I was like, oh, Sorry. Okay, just moving on. Yeah, that's an uh, important slide to pause on. That's like all the rules. Yeah, I didn't describe them, and it didn't so, describe the yeah. order very well. Because so. it, yeah, it's such a pain in the... It's not useful. This, I think, is also useful because it helps break down those sections. Maybe the color's a little weird there. But all you're trying to do is break down all the nitty-gritty details behind each of those things, and you're ultimately applying it back to this.